The simple answer is the less you buy, the better. Kind of against how businesses work, right? Well, the politicians are not going to do anything, so using the brand as a platform to drive change as a voice for what you believe in and fight for. Yeah. What's the balance of like your commercial objective, yeah. of, but also being responsible to what you're yeah. doing? Yeah, we, we've, we've been working on that for 20 years. Tom, 20 years, eight figure business, there are 150 people now, yeah. 11 stores around the country. There's so much more for us to do. It feels like um, we're just getting started. Because I wasn't a clothes designer, uh -huh. I wasn't a businessman at yeah. all. I built this windproof, waterproof fleece that kept you, your cold bodies warm. Man. At the moment, you literally feel like the whole world is ending totally, around yeah. you. Yeah, the massive like emotional, psychological battle that's going on in your head. Oh my God, this is harder than I thought. Shit, I'm in the swamp of despair. Hard question. Yeah. What's been your hardest moment over the last 20 years, would you say, with growing the business? It's 2024. A new year, new month, and a new guest on the sofa. Welcome to episode six of Charl Chats, the e-commerce podcast. My name's Nick. I'm the founder of Charl, a Shopify agency here in London. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our home for some very open, honest, and real conversations with some absolute A players in e-commerce right now. So without further ado, let's do this. Tom, 20 years of growing an eight-figure business and 11 stores around the country. What is the story of Finisterre? So the brand is, as I said, like 20 years old, um, and it was always born from a deep belief in a better way of making product and existing as a business. Uh, and so we've had that mindset since day one, and that's been our sort of true north, our kind of guiding light around product, environment, people. Um, and so, yeah, it's that, that's kind of kept us going through the many ups and downs of any founder entrepreneur journey, uh, a brand. And in many ways, even after 20 years, it feels like um, we're just getting started, which is like exhausting and exciting at the same time because there's so much more for us to do. And we, we, you know, we've got a really kind of a transformative mindset as a business, and that's exciting to be part of. So Tom, if I just rewind 20 years, yeah. what led you to the very first moment of even thinking about starting a brand? Yeah, sure. So I mean, I, 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 I sort of, yeah, to sort of answer that question, go back to look at sort of, you know, my makeup, I suppose. And mm. the sea's always been a big part of my life and something that I was brought up with and um, has always been around. Uh, and I did sort of marine biology uh, or biology and marine focus at university and then end up in London as a chart surveyor. And, like, you know, that time in my life, I was like, right, let's, you know, excited for life. And it wasn't an exciting place to find myself. So I thought about how I could like, really bring my passions and beliefs into, into a business. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately a brand as a set of like emotional uh, values and things you stand for. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be around cold water surfing, which is the sort of surfing I was doing in this country where it's, uh, and, and other countries around here where on its day it's as good as anywhere else in the world, but it is cold. Uh, it was about making product in a better way. Uh, you know, better fabrics, better transparency, recycled, sustainable, that sort of thing. Um, and also back then, you know, there was a lot of the brands that I saw that were sort of marketing themselves at me. Um, you know, I surf brands for sort of bikinis and board shorts. And here was I like, you know, it's February and I'm in the sea. Mm -hmm. I don't need, I need, I need that proper built, built for last, built to last product that it forms as a fun functional need as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sort of, and then that, those, those are sort of the ingredients for the brand. Uh, and so then I moved to Cornwall to St. Agnes where the brand is based. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so our, our headquarters, are, I suppose, you know, on the, on the cliff of, you know, the North Atlantic and it's been there ever since. Yeah. So you moved to Cornwall. Was that to set up the brand yeah. or was it? Yeah. It was. Wow. I mean, I'd always had like a strong connection to there and used to work there in the summers and stuff like that. So I'd always sort of, and I'm a big surfer. So uh, it was, uh, and for me, it was also important that if you go down there, I mean, um, you walk into the office at Wheel Kitty and it's sort of the workshop and it feels like the sort of place, you know, we are making product for this environment, which is outside our door. So it's mm -hmm. a real, there's a real sort of credibility and authenticity to it. Yeah. I was reading online that you've had like a really humble beginning, like top of a surf shop kind of yeah, starting. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that, like initial yeah. really like, I, I, I imagine it was like super messy, proper like um, startup vibes. Yeah, it Am was. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was real startup vibes. And um, 
Yeah, there's still startup vibes now. You know, yeah. those startup vibes don't go away. Yeah. Um, and the, yeah, so it was, you know, so I had the name of the brand, Finister means end of the earth, land's end. It's an old chilling forecast there on Radio 4. And for me, that was an important thing. The brand had a meaning, basically, in terms of the space it was looking mm -hmm. to be, as well as for me personally, because I can remember listening to shipping forecast in my parents' car and imagine these boats off, miles off at sea. Um, and then the product we were going to make was, it had to be something that's really fit for purpose. And I built this windproof, waterproof, breathable fleece that when you get out of the sea in the middle of a February, like freezing day, it's what you put on when you're getting out of the sea. And it was like, it was, you know, kept you, your cold bodies warm. And so there's mm -hmm. a need for the product. It was functional, it's made in Devon. It had a really good story. And it was literally like three page website, um, fleece at one end of my bedroom, flat above the surf shop, shared flat above the surf, surf shop. You had, it was early days e-com then, you had to get your housemates off the phone to get on your <laughs> website. You, you guys probably remember that, but you had to like dial up modems and you had to kind of like, um, you know, there wasn't any two, three, even five, well, no G's around then. Do you um, know, I do actually remember that yeah, as yeah, a kid. Yeah. I remember when my mum would be on the phone yeah, to my yeah. auntie, the, everything else would just like cut out and the, the box would do that beeping noise. Yeah, that like, awful beeping noise. Yeah. So yeah, I had to kind of get back from work, I was working part-time then as well, sort of the real sort of startup hustle, and then get back and log on and we get everyone off, you know, they're normally on to bed, everyone would get on, they get on then and check the orders and, you know, and because I think, because this was a really good story to the brand and there's a reason why it started and why we existed and where we came from and there's a need for the brand and the product. We are also supporting, you know, uh, marine conservation charities and that sort of thing, surf skin sewage. Um, you know, back then it was, people started writing about the business and the product was really good and it was really functional and people really kind of rated it. And you still see it around now, 20 years later. So, uh, sort of stood the test of time, uh, but we start getting write-ups and uh, people are talking about it, and then you start getting orders coming in. And it wasn't like you know tons and tons of orders. It was like you know three fleeces a week would be a good week. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And it's like and just built from there, yeah. And what was it that made you like choose a coat first of all? Because I imagine that's like quite a hard project product yeah. to choose, right? And yeah, I mean it's a really hard. I mean I often get asked that question by uni students, and it's like you know your first product, and it wasn't because I wasn't a clothes designer, uh -huh. I wasn't a businessman at yeah. all, but I believed there's a room in the world for a brand like Finisterre, and so I um, it was it was super you know it was super important that the product was representative of the brand. It wasn't just like another t-shirt company or you know hooded top. It's actually had there's a real kind of legitimacy, I suppose, and and uh, authenticity to the and the integrity to the product. Uh, and so yeah, it took about six or nine months to build that first product. You know, testing fleeces, um, you know, getting them you know wet, dry, whatever. You know, sending up to you know rain rooms. Be you know, so, so it really was as good as I intended it to be. Which it was. So yeah, it was it was a hard ask actually. But it was it was just um again that sort of found a hustle, you know, to kind of get get stuff done that you believe in and you know, working it out as you go along. Yeah, I mean like not to be rude, but like twenty years ago I imagine it was a lot harder to like source yeah. fabrics. Like I don't even know where I'd start now, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, I'm no fashion designer, but like just to I imagine twenty years ago when the internet was still new and a novelty. Where did you start in like, oh, right, I'm going to make a coat uh, and I want to find some really good fabrics. Not being a fashion designer yourself, you, you mentioned that it was kind of mm. like a bit of a hustle for you. Yeah. Did you like source fabrics locally or? Yeah, I mean, it was it was literally like, it was, you know, it was before the, the internet wasn't really, I mean, it sounds crazy now, but it wasn't really, you did, <laughs> Google wasn't really around. Yeah. You know, you'd have to, I'd say it was basically, you know, even like yellow pages, getting, looking up fabric suppliers. I'd drive around the country visiting fabric suppliers, sourcing fabrics, getting stuff sent in, sometimes, you know, from wherever it was, then combining fabrics and, you know, and actually got a combination that was totally unique. And, um, yeah, it was just, you know, it was it was warmth and it was windproof and it was waterproof and it was like, yeah, it was it was it was a real um it was like a product no one had ever seen before actually at the time. It was quite innovative. Um and but you know, there was also it was also more expensive. Mm -hmm. And so there was an education in the customers to why it was more expensive and why we were doing what we we're doing and why we were working these fabrics and you know, the the product really had a relevance to um, what it was intended to do and where it's made from. And you know, we, we kind of talked to customers about that quite a lot. So y you get your first coat. Yeah. You're happy with the product. I imagine you're like, you're in the middle of Cornwall. You've got all the right people around you to like test it, give you yeah. feedback quickly. Your own lifestyle is probably able to like, actually, is this product any good? Mm -hmm. So you, you set up your first website. Where did you start? Was it like word of mouth? Was it 
Right. Yeah, so I mean, I think you know, like, a lot of the, you know, I think for for brands starting out today, like you've got to have like you know, you know what, what's your, your point of difference, mm -hmm. and if that's one that is memorable, people will talk about it. Mm -hmm. And you know, for us, it was this beautifully made product by you know cold surfers it, for, for cold water surfers in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the sort of people talked about it. Yeah, and um, the name is romantic but real, finished there, and, so, and it's and people they just and, and when people got the product, they sort of they really raced it. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, so it's word of mouth from a brand point of view, and you know because the brand was born out of necessity um, and a need for the brand, which I've always believed in it. You know, you got write-ups and people talked about it. You know, they, it made sense why we existed. It's not just another consumer product that mm -hmm. you don't necessarily need. It's like actually it exists for a reason. Um, and so, um, yeah, so the word of mouth, and then, you know, you've got journalists writing about it and you ring up and you get in mag, you're just hassling all kinds of journalists and stuff. I wanted to reply all to all of the Guardian journalists and uh, <laughs> that didn't go down too well. <laughs> but you know, you're, you're, but you're like, I said, you know, back then it was just me. My sister was involved in the early years. But it was just me um, actually at the, you know, doing it day to day. And you'd be ringing up, um, um, you know, all of the mag You just go to magazines, just ring up the journalists, hustle them, you know, and you, then you'd get the, get the orders in, send the fleeces out. Mm -hmm. My mum and dad used to pack the fleeces and have them around the kitchen table and stuff and, like, put the tags on. So it was proper, like, yeah, startup mentality, yeah. Yeah. And what do you think the moment was when it went from, like, you creating a good product getting a bit of word of mouth to the, you actually going, fucking hell, I've actually got a really good business here. Because I imagine as a founder myself, there's always moments like, I don't know if this is going to work out. Yeah. It might do, it might not. Yeah, I mean, it does, they, you know, their whole founder mentality is, you know, that, that's, you know, so, you know, great work you're doing what you've done. It's like, it's hard to start something and it's really hard because it's not only you have a business sort of thing, it's a massive like emotional, psychological, um, you know, battle that's going on in your head you know and joining something that started as much as in starting something from scratch so um yeah it's a really good um i've just started this linkedin um post called founder fridays mm -hmm. it's only like four weeks but i talk about like sort of founder mentality and sort of insights of 20 years of being a founder and uh, I put one up last week. You should check it out. It's called The Emotional Journey of Doing Anything Really Great. Was this like The Rock? And you got yeah, the and bridge? You go, yeah, and you go, I saw like, it. Yeah, you should check it out. It's cool. But, and you can look at it. And, it, and whatever business in or what sort of founder you are, it's like you can relate. And it's like, that's a good idea. Oh, my God, this is hard. And I thought, shit, I'm in the swamp of despair. And it's like, and, and you go, you're going to go on that journey a lot through that life. But knowing that it's like inevitable and necessary probably for you to kind of keep on going is, um, yeah, so it's, you know, we had, as, as a founder, you have these highs and lows. So it's, it, it, yeah, and, and yeah, so the, but I think you believe in what you're doing and why you're doing it. That's, that, that's where the emotional sort of thing comes out. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's so to answer your question in terms of like, was it a good business? Um, you know, it's not like someone goes, here's a good business, do it because everyone will be doing that. You have to kind of build the business and, you know, sometimes it's like you're building a brand and you're like really leaning into that side. Then you're doing some sales and they kind of, they kind of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what, how you, you know, and you, the ultimate thing if it's a good business is whether you still believe in it, you know, it doesn't matter what size it is or, you know, whatever you make, but it's like, you've just got to believe in it as a founder and then that's a good business, yeah. I actually love that post you did last week. I I I, I really studied it. That that swamp of despair yeah, made yeah, me it's think. Funny, it's good, I remember I was in like the first eight months of starting this business, mm. and I remember I literally stood outside my flat in Clapham, and I was just <laughs> fucking crying in the street. Yeah, oh God, I was. Yeah. I was like calling all my friends, like it's all going wrong. Everything's yeah. going fucking terrible. Yeah, I it's, related. It's hard, yeah. And and do you know what? Now when we every business still has its shit times, like Charles has its challenging moments, and I look back and go, God, if this was happening then, I'd have been in like an absolute mess. But yeah, at the moment, you literally feel like the whole world is ending totally, around yeah. you. Yeah. So I absolutely love it that you are like promoting that like moment of shit that founders have yeah, to go through. Yeah, there's a vulnerability you have, like you know, you have to because you read those, those overnight success stories in the paper, and you like, I think everyone's like, you know, it's just been easy for other mm -hmm. people like that. But it's actually like behind the scenes, there's always hardship and stress and emotional kind of you know you get you know you get knocked psychologically it's hard it's really hard so having that 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 journey and yeah and i've met loads of people have said oh my i've just i'm here there i actually i actually 
gave it to everyone at work. I just, they look, we had like an away day and I said, listen, look at this. And, you know, I'm the founder and I've been through it, but you know, you're all doing really good stuff if you're in product or marketing or in retail, whatever it is. And loads of people just like pinned it up and put it on by the desk and put little arrows where they were on it. So it's, it's, it, I love it. It's a good thing. And like you said, everyone can relate to it. And I think the important thing is to know that when you're in that, when you're in that hard place is where you go for your own resilience because you've got to, you've got to maintain that resilience as a, as a founder of an entrepreneur to be able to kind of get through it. And, um, and so people go all kinds of places for that, but you've got to know um, what yours is. I also think like around founders, there is naturally often like a little bit of naivety, right? In terms of like, yeah. oh, I'm going to take on the world. I'm, I'm going to, I've got this idea. And the reality then hits pretty hard what actually is involved in a business. Like, I don't come from a business background. I was a bloody paramedic, completely. No different. way. Okay. So um, I completely relate to you yeah, having yeah. a background. So, you, I, you know, what I thought was, oh, we're going to make great websites and it's going to be amazing. And the reality hit very hard, all the challenges of people and yeah. all that kind of stuff. But Tom, hard question. Yeah. What's been your hardest moment over the, the last 20 years, would you say, with growing the business? Um... I mean, I think, you know, like, you know, businesses that grow, unless you're really profitable out that's to start with, um, which we weren't, um, you know, access to finance and capital is, is, is really important. And you, it doesn't often get talked about, actually, but, you know, like, sort of financial sustainability is, is you know, you've got to be financially sustainable to kind mm -hmm. of grow. And so for me, it's always been, you know, we've always because we're growing quite fast. And with us, it's like quite capital intensive in terms of like us buying a load of stock for a season and it's D to C. And so you're, and we have stores obviously as well, but um, you know, you, it's quite, it's very capital intensive, these these clothing businesses, mm -hmm. you know? And so, um, yeah, the hard thing has, has always been access to, you know, getting funding and financing. So we have great investors uh, and we also have uh, a lot of crowd investors actually. So 20% mm -hmm. of our business is owned by our community, mm -hmm. which is cool. I mean, the first Amazing. we did crowd raise back in 2019, I think it was, um, you know, raised, raised like four million quid in like 10, 10 days. It was quite, it was big. It's incredible. And the exciting thing was that that was a really big moment for me personally, because a lot of people are customers and they were getting behind the brand and believing in it. And a lot of people were not, not loads of people were putting in loads and loads of money. It was lots of people putting in like 500 quid, a thousand quid, like, you know, great, good amounts of money. But it's not like, you know, one guy writing the whole check sort of yeah. thing. And um, so it was, and you know, so having that kind of belief from the community, um, I suppose to answer your question, that was like the biggest thing was, is, you know, was is, is finding, funding and financing these businesses for in our sector. And then when you actually get that kind of validation like that from our community in terms of we really believe in where you're doing, what you're doing and where you're going and we're going to get behind you. That was, that, was, that was a really big moment. And has there been moments, you know, over the course of your growth where you, you thought, fucking hell, this is, this is not going the way I want it to go. Um, has there yeah, been those loads. kind of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, well, it's kind of, you know, you put, you make plans and you make forecasts and it never goes, to, it never goes how you, you know, it's a, co that's a constant actually. It's never going how you think it's going to go. I mean, there's, you know, you have like a pandemic, mm -hmm. you have Brexit, you have all sorts of stuff yeah. like, and the best laid plans and all that sort of thing. So it never goes how you think it's going to go, but you have to have that kind of, that, energy and that kind of that sort of startup hustle I often call it to be able to deal with those things and ultimately you believe and all your team believe you're going you're way going in the right direction you've got a higher purpose of business beyond the transaction uh which we do um and you, that that's kind of that's you know that's that's your kind of you know mark and sound way of getting where you at, how you actually get there it's not always a straight line mm -hmm. so uh that's a given it's not going to go as you think it's going to go uh, but it's your ability to sort of deal with those 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 challenges um, as they come. One thing you said earlier really interested me, and you said that you know we still feel like a startup. Yeah. We still have those vibes, which I relate to a lot. And I think, but actually, you know, when you're leading a very fast-growing business yeah. and uh, of, of your scale, I imagine it's pretty tough to to keep your own like mental stamina on point to make sure you can lead that business through and so on. Yeah. Well, what some of the things have you done to kind of like, I'm sure you've had very down days where you feel like everything's going fucking wrong, yeah. but actually just being able to pick yourself up and go, no, we got this. Yeah. Um, we're going to push through. 
Is there any like things that you do like? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I think you know, surrounding your play, you're surrounding your, yourself with really, really good people. Is um, it, that's a really, you know, I'm off, we're really lucky that, um, and you know, really one of the, I'm always really super proud of everyone that sort of joined Finisterre and helped sort of jump on board and steer the ship and you know, taking the ideas I had and made them better. You know, so and that so for me, there's you know, there's an element of like. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like, like, I don't bike, but, you know, if you're in the peloton or if you're, my, I'm more like a flock of geese and, you know, sometimes someone's at the front flying and then they, they and that's the hardest place to be and then you go to go to the back and so everyone sort of takes turns to carry stuff now um, and you're know, having really good people around you to, you know, really sort of solid, solid team is amazing and that you, and you kind of get support off each other uh, in whatever way that is uh, and me personally, like I, Spend time with my family. Um, I get in the sea, um, and I sort of like get inspiration from sort of like moments of um, resilience that I see out in the, in the world. That you know, be nature or humans or whatever it is that um, kind of you know, give me strength. Yeah, nice. I think I always find like speaking to lots of kind of like leaders in ecom since starting this podcast. Everyone has their like their thing. Mm -hmm. They like they just take themselves away and they have their moment to kind of like come back, recharge. I yeah. actually saw a really good. Um, LinkedIn post the other day, it was like, are you unplugging or are you recharging? Which I actually quite relate to because like in, oh God, I think even last year there were like weekends where I was like, so I felt so burnt out where I was on the sofa, just like not moving. But it's actually very interesting. Like, does that actually recover you from like really what intense do do, periods? Me, I absolutely love being on my own and yeah. going like, go to the gym or go for a dog walk. Or, yeah, cool. But just like a little bit of my own moment. Yeah. Just to like reconnect. It's, important. it's really important. Yeah, because I think you can get, I, th I, I think about this a lot actually. And I think I've contemplated on like, am I resting or am I recharging? And it's like, sometimes you go and do something after a really busy period of time and you feel like you've got all the energy in the world, but other yeah. times you can just lay there and you feel like you've got zero energy. Yeah, yeah. So you spoke a little bit about, you know, you've got a great team around mm -hmm. you. And I know that you have a, a CEO within yeah. uh, Finisterre. Now I imagine that must have been a moment in the business. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, you know, it is and it isn't. It's sort of, you know, I'm the founder and, um, you know, originally when you got a CEO, there's about 40 or 50 people in business. And I was just like, listen, I, I can't go and do this sort of the founder brand stuff. And then also, um, you know, give the people who are in the business and need my attention, the attention they need. So you're sort of, you're sort of dividing. So I was like, I need some help. Um, and I haven't got a particularly big ego, so it was it was no problem for me getting someone in to help me run the business who's you know way better than I am. So, mm -hmm. and but you know we 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 work really well together. Mm -hmm. Nice. And did you find that like there must have been an element of letting go on quite a lot of responsibility? Did yeah, you? but you know it's letting go of things that you're not necessarily like is you know you're not bad at, mm -hmm. but someone else could be better at them. Yeah. And then the stuff that I can then go and focus on, like, you know, everyone says when businesses grow, you know, roles and teams, so you narrow and specialize, uh, you know, like you start off and you've got like a bigger role, then as it grows, then the, the role become more specialized. So uh, hopefully where I am now as a pure founder um, and sort of, like, I suppose, ambassador for the brand and getting to new places and, you know, still like working really hard and committed to the, the journey we're on um, means that I add value more in that role as opposed to doing other stuff that you know I wouldn't be so well suited to. Um, what is your day to day, Tom? Uh, varies. I mean, I have like do lots of stuff with products, mm -hmm. lots of stuff with content, um, storytelling, um, international stuff. You know, getting right people on board. Um, it's quite varied. You know, surfing. Um, you know, getting to sea when I can. You know, two or three times a week probably. Nice. Um, yeah. So let's talk about product a bit more sure. because on site, like you guys really talk about like product, environment, people, and the impact that yep. your brand has, which I think is, we don't see it that often, right? Yep. Across the fashion, uh, the fashion community. Um, so where did this goal like start from? Has it always been something you're super passionate yeah. about? Yeah. I mean, it's always, it was always about starting business and you know, making, you know, really, really great product in a better way. And that's like, you never, that's, that's a transformative kind of approach. You're never going to be like, Cool, we've you know done it because, you know, fifteen or even ten years ago you couldn't get recycled fabric. You know, no one was talking about sustainability. B Corp wasn't even a thing hardly. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so, you know, now the, the sort of the, you know, the watermark and all that sort of stuff has really lifted, uh, which is great. Um, but we, we I, you know, I started the business out specifically to answer, you know, what I saw wasn't going on in businesses, wasn't going on in our industry, um, you know, be that, you know, recycled fabrics, natural fibers, organic cottons, uh, traceability, transparency, all that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's been part of who we are since day one. And, you know, and, and you know, it exists now even more so than then and we'll, con- and we'll continue to be, we'll continue to do so because it's an ever-changing kind of landscape. I think... You mentioned that kind of like sustainability was not a focus 20 odd years ago or whatever. And now it feels like everyone's talking about it at the moment, doesn't it? Now, for the consumer, I imagine it's like really challenging to figure out who's actually making a difference here. Yeah. Who's just marketing and doing a bit of greenwashing. What's your view on all of this? Like, what does it actually mean to like really make it a sustainable Well, you know, there's a few things that I'm talking about there. I mean, I think the... You know, so yeah, twenty years ago, it wasn't really a thing, mm-hmm. um, and I was always like, right, if we're going to start a business, we need for it, and we've got to do, we got to be better than other businesses that were there before in terms of what we do and you know consumption and how we make and have a, you know, you know, I was I'd been in marine biology since I knew about the importance of the ocean in our life, and I had a personal connection to the sea, and I wanted to replicate that to the brand. Um, and that's kind of runs deep in, in Finisterre. Um, and then, you know, then sort of uh, rightly so, everyone's like, you know, aware of the climate crisis and everything that's going on. And so how do you exist the business in that kind of backdrop? And, you know, you know we don't really, we sort of moving away from sustainability because it's actually not a very um, sort of inspiring word, actually, in fact, because, you know, that just means like maintaining, sustaining, mm-hmm. sustaining what was there before. And if you looked around you now, you're like, well, is this good enough? And you're like, not really. You know, so we're sustaining what we have. It's like not actually good enough. It should be like, you know, positive impact, regenerative, those sort of things. So, um, yeah, so I think it's important that people realize that sustainability, yeah, is an overused word. It isn't really good enough. Oh, it hasn't been for a while. Uh, and in terms of, you know, they have, you know, everyone can vote with, um, an email or a post or whatever it is um, and find the you know, ask questions of brands that they are buying from uh, and you know and, and where it's made how it's made uh, B Corp's a really good thing uh, it's got a lot of I mean, a bit of negative press lately but it's a really good sort of independent third party accreditation that you are doing what you're saying you're doing as a business and it covers all areas of the business and you're basically high, held to very high environmental and uh, transparency and sort of social um, standards by an independent body. So it's, it's, so it's not, for, so that's, that's a, yeah, looking for B Corps is a good, is a good place for cons- customers and consumers to start, I think. Is there any, so like, cons- we know that consumers are becoming like way more savvy around where they're buying product from, yeah. where the product's made. What would you advise consumers? So like B Corp is obviously one of them, but like for me, if I went and asked a brand that I was maybe buying from, like, how is it made? Like, for me, I still wouldn't know that if that's good or bad. Like sometimes it, you can be so kind of like greenwashed and there's so much stuff out there. It's like the fitness industry, isn't it? It's like you hear so many different things about how you're going to lose weight that it actually becomes so confusing. Yeah, I mean, you know, like basically, if you, okay, the simple answer is the less you buy, the better. Yeah. So just buy, you know, buy something really, you know, that is going to last a long time that you, you know, you generally believe in the brand that you're buying from. And... Um, you know, just buy well and just buy it once. And then rather than buying something like four times in like four years, uh, because, you know, and it, it's not for me to sort of say what people can or can't afford. That's not our business. But we put out a product that uh, is durable, is long lasting. We help you fix it. We have repair stations in our stores. Uh, we help you look after it. And, you know, you connect to that product emotionally. And so you look after it. And so, if you ultimately look at it and say, well, it's more about a better way of, because we'll have to buy stuff, it's about a better way of buying stuff mm-hmm. that's going to be better for the planet, then the least you, the less you buy, the better. And when you do buy, you buy well. Uh, one thing I absolutely loved, right, when looking through your current website, is yeah. like, you're so transparent with absolutely everything to yeah. the point of like, you've got photos of your packaging and, yeah. and the impact of that, where all your factories are. 
Like, where did that come about? Because I feel that's quite a bold move to go, hey, this is where our factories are. We've done it for a long time. Done really? It for like over 15 years, probably. We used to think, oh, I spy, and you could... Well, that's... We just, like... Maybe it's reflection of who I am, but, like, we're kind of... We're pretty open and honest to the brand, and it's like, you know, this is who we are, and this is what we're doing, and I'm not saying it's everyone, but if you want to be a part of it, we'll show you where stuff's made, and... Um, yeah, and we don't have all the answers. We, we're not perfect, and so, you know, there's often conversations we're having around, you know where stuff's made, how it's made, whatever. But it's sort of, we, we sort of share that and, you know, people understand that it's not like, you know, pre-packaged business that you're just perfect and off you go. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, it's it's living in, in the world that we're living in. And with that comes conversations and iterations and evolution of ideas and concepts and that sort of thing. And we use the brand to do that. And we're honest about the journey we're on with our customers. So, and we've always done that with our factories for, for a long time now. Now, in terms of kind of like, so if you're a new e-commerce brand starting out, yeah. right? Let's go back 20 years. Yeah. Um, but present day. And you're a brand that's actually wanting to kind of like create a range of product that is, has some really good ethics behind it mm. and, and do some of the things that you've spoken about. Yeah. But, you said it before, these businesses are cash intensive, right? Yeah. And I I guess as a non-expert would be some of the things we're talking about are probably expensive um, to do, not on scale initially. Yeah. Is there any kind of like advice or tips that you'd give for starting a, a brand out that it has some really good um, kind of like ethics behind it yeah. for things that are having a positive impact? Because I imagine it's so easy to like use third party fulfillment providers that you don't really know what's going on behind closed doors or going on Alibaba and shipping loads of t-shirts. So what's overall. the question? So like, what, what advice would you give to new brands starting out who want to um, maybe take on some of those similar ethics? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing if it is like now, if you're starting a business, you know, it, I suppose when I started a business, like being, you know, having this kind of strong values and, you know, you know ethics or, you know, being this sort of business that we, we are, was quite unique, i.e. there weren't that many people doing it or brands doing it. Now, um, it's like, it's almost like, this is like table stakes. You know, if you're starting something now, you should be aware of what's going on, going on out there mm -hmm. in the world. And so your business should have these things. So it's almost like, it's like, it's just a given that you should be doing this and using business as a force for good or, um, you know, using the business beyond just transaction to drive change. Um, and so it's really about making sure that, um, I guess what I'm saying is that there, the, there's a sort of point of difference around what you're doing. Um, and you still have to stand out as a brand. As being ethical is not enough to stand out as a brand. Mm -hmm. You have to do that and stand out a brand as well as that. And I guess it's like way beyond product as well. It's like the way that you run campaigns, the yeah, way that you're... you talk and, you know, content and who you're supporting and that sort of thing, yeah. Now, you mentioned, you know, buy as little as possible. Yeah. Which is obviously like against the, kind of against how businesses work, right? We want people to, to buy yeah. and make money and that's how we keep growing. How does a brand like Finisterre, like really carefully create product ranges that, you know, prevent overconsumption? So we're like, we've got uh, Black Friday coming up, yep. Christmas uh, and so on. Yeah. What's the balance of like your commercial objective? Yeah. Because of course you want to grow, right? Of course, yeah. Um, but also um, being responsible to what you're yeah. doing too. I mean, that does, that, we've, we've been working that out for 20 years and still, still work it out on a daily basis. Mm. And so it's like reconciling that growth, driving change, having a bigger, you know, the bigger you are, the bigger impact you can have and the more change you can drive. Uh, but albeit we're doing it in a responsible way. And working with product that is, you know, that is made in the right way, uh, long lasting, that sort of thing. So from a product point of view, uh, it's a sort of choice of fabrics to start with. It's how it's made, it's where it's made, and then most of, you know, most of the environmental impact, um, you know, from a product, you know, a lot of it comes in terms of like when it's in the customer's hands, like the amount it's washed and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and uh, what happens in its life. So we can try and extend the life of the product with repairs, and our repairs part of the business is quite big now in terms of it. A lot of people now use it and get a new patch, put on a jacket. Well, they might not do it. We do like online stuff on how to repair your jacket, you know? So we help customers really hopefully fall in love with their products. And if you like, if you love, if you connect with something, 
um, you're going to you know, keep it going for longer. So, and then we do, you know, take back schemes, uh, relived and uh, reloved rather, where we, you know, we can exchange, you can show trading product, there's a secondhand site, that sort of thing. So you might have a jacket that's actually really perfectly okay, but it's four or five years old. And mm -hmm. you're like, do you know what? I fancy a new one because I'm just a bit bored of that, which is, you know, that's a, you know, it's a reality of, you know, that happens. Uh, but it's, you, you can trade that in you know, get a voucher and buy a new one. So you can sort of, you can sort of swap in, swap out. So sort of secondhand sort of stuff is, is, is big as well. And that, then that product goes on someone else. We, 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 we take it in, we clean it and, you know, make it good again. And it goes out as a, you know, as a, as a product, someone else. So you kind of, there's more, there's less sort of like, um, linear sort of product life cycle. And so just making sure products exist for as long as possible out there. So you don't have to remake it. Uh, which is where a lot of the environmental impact happens. I love that. I love that you guys have got like repairs going on. Yeah. Like, that is awesome. Done that for a while as well, yeah. That, that is, honestly, I've not seen brands doing that. I think that's that's a really nice touch. And and like you said, like if you fall in love with that product, like the idea of then going, ah, oh, it's got a hole in it. I mean, I wouldn't have a clue where to start with patching up a hole, but um, being able to like get it repaired, I think really, really a nice touch. But then in terms of like campaigns like Black Friday, yeah. uh, I mean, it feels like, whole month of it now it's already yep. started like i've seen so many emails and brands i'm just being bombarded with with their campaigns for this month what's what's your guys take on like how you manage yeah so we do we don't do we don't discount on black friday weekend okay. haven't done for a while and we call it blue friday and actually for every order we receive over the black friday weekend we donate two pounds to finish their foundation so it's a charitable part of the business the coc mm -hmm. and um it was actually set by my, by my wife and it's um, it's amazing and it is all about equal access to the ocean for all. So a lot of people have barriers to getting in the sea. You know, one of the things I'm lucky to be brought up with and I do regularly without any problem. But for many people, they have barriers of getting into the sea. So as a brand, we want to connect people to the sea. So how do we help people that have a barrier? And that could be socioeconomic. Uh, confidence, religious, whatever it is, um, you know, um, you know, just just ability, it's confidence around water, whatever it is. So, um, and we do two pounds a donation to the foundation over Blue Friday weekend. So all like, weekend, every order we get, we do two pounds donation to the foundation, and that's like our way of you know not discounting, selling. You know, we still sell more product because it's a busy weekend in the in the trading calendar. Uh, but also making sure that if you do order with us, it's making a difference to, um, yeah, to, to, to people that we feel need it. Yeah, nice. I, I love some of the smaller touches that you've got, like running through your brand. Like I saw on the site, you've got like, this, you don't really see sale, you see like last chance. And it's like the copy and the way that you communicate that products are, you know, coming to end of yeah. life or whatever. I think really runs through, through the whole business. Um, now, I absolutely love that you guys have, you know, a separate foundation. Mm -hmm. I'd love to dive into that a little sure, bit more. Like, wh when did that start? Tom? Uh, but we've always done quite a lot of support, you know, for causes like that over the years and given products out. And then it started like two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so my wife sort of set it up and did an amazing job with the team and stuff. And um, yeah, it was, it was, it became clear that, so for instance, the, but the first Blue Friday we ran, one of the biggest barriers of getting into the ocean is actually getting into a wetsuit. And I didn't even realize this. I did it like, you know, regularly my whole life, you know. And um, I was at the surf therapy talk, and I was talking conferences talking about the foundation. And then it became clear that for a lot of people, they have real trouble getting into a wetsuit. And that could be sensory issues, or if you've got a phys physical disability, or um, whatever it is. So we then, the money we raised in the first Blue Friday event, we put it towards adapting wetsuits. So you could write into the foundation and say, hi, I'm this person, and I've got this problem, we're getting into a wetsuit, can you help me out? And they could send their wetsuit in. We then would put a zip on it in a different place or alter it so that it fit it would fit them or make it easy to get in out of. And um, yeah, we got these letters back from families whose kids couldn't get in the water because they couldn't get into a wetsuit and so wouldn't get in with the rest of the family. And um, yeah, it was, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a really powerful thing actually. Um, and yeah, I suppose passing on that 
my love of the sea through the brand, through what we do as a business, and then having this part of it now is is it's really exciting and really good. And does that foundation kind of sit with the day to day of the business as well? Is there quite a? I mean, obviously, it's like yeah. come from the business, if you like. Uh, obviously, you, you mentioned that um, you've got your Blue Friday. That's yeah. kind of impact. Is there any other bits that you do throughout? Yeah, the we year? do, we do, we do, we do fundraisers where. We'll do weekends where we'll do like a uh, two pound donation goes to um, a really good um, surf community club up in uh, northeast called mm -hmm. Yonder, which is all about uh, women who've lost their confidence going in the sea. Uh, we did thing for uh, Pride with Queer Surf Club, uh, raising money. So we use, we use it in, in various forms. And so these are all like elements of breaking. So it's the wetsuit or it's the... Uh, the Pride, uh, or oh, it's uh, Yonder for women at risk who've had trouble getting back, you know, the, anyone who's kind of lost their confidence. So, yeah, it gets used in multiple ways um, throughout the year. But the, but the Blue Friday is sort of the, the I suppose, the, 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 you, we start talking about that. That's why I mentioned it. Um, and it's in a few weeks, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, that's, the, that, 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 that's the big event that runs over four days that we, as a fundraiser for the foundation, yeah. So, kind of, Going back to that kind of like initial balance of commercial growth, um, but also responsibility to your your own values. Yes. Yeah. What does growth look like for Finisterre? What, what, you know, what what would what would a maybe a fast fashion? There'll be like more product quickly as possible, get out the door, attract yeah. more people, get them to buy more and more and more. I imagine you guys have to really think about growth in a very different way because you're promoting the idea that you keep product for a very long yeah. time. Yeah, I mean, it's about, you know, you, I think you probably have, we, you know, lucky of a lot, a lot of customer loyalty. So mm -hmm. people, you know, hopefully understand a lot of stuff we just talked about um, and, you know, and are willing to kind of, you know, have a, a long term involvement with a brand like that mm -hmm. and may buy less often, but over a longer period of time, you know, stick with Finister because of what we do and, how, and all the stuff we discuss. So um, I guess that there's a, there's a sort of, you know, and, you know, you meet people all around who have known a brand for 20 years and that's always a real pleasure to meet people who, you know, love what we do and you know, love the products and they've got good feedback and stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, generally people stick with us for a long time. And so rather than it being like, a, you know, a hit, an Instagram hit, that you you know you get 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 here get get the products then it's a bit flat when it rises because you've had this like quite kind of clinical engagement with a brand that's got into your feed that's sent you some stuff and you got it and it's like now what whereas we kind of hopefully have we you know, yeah I, I think we do this and you've always done this and really commit to it we always like have great dialogue with our customers and our community. We'd have events in our stores. Um, we had a foundation. Uh, and so for me, growth is really, you know, it's always exciting when it's bigger than a transaction. Uh, and if it's like realization of what we're doing and trying to drive change and the sort of brand we're seen as is really important. Yeah, nice. I, I mean, I've followed your brand for years, to be yeah. very honest with you. I used to have a, um, a really bright orange puff oh, coat. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Loved it. Yeah. Absolutely loved it. My friends were like, where's your orange coat? Um, but just taking it back to kind of like partnerships in terms of, yeah. you, we've, we've spoken about the foundation, but uh, have you guys worked with other charities um, before? Yeah, I mean, we've done stuff with the, so I, I was a, um, uh, like an RNLI crew member for mm -hmm. 20 years and one of the helms as well. There's a station in St. Agnes just on the coast from, down the cliff from the, the workshop and, um, yeah, something I always wanted to do, moving to like a coastal community. So, yeah, I was on the I was on the crew for, and I st yeah, I haven't officially left actually, but um, I had some family stuff going last mm -hmm. year, which means I had to step away. But um, yeah, so I, that and that's an amazing charity that is you know two hundred years old now. And mm -hmm. so we do we've done fundraisers where we did a collaboration with the RNLI, which is amazing because they brought all of their you know seafaring you know, heritage, and, you know, like literally men and women rowing out in the teeth of gales and like you know 1924 whatever it was um and then that sort of volunteer ethos still exists today and you have a pager and you run down and you are risking your life potentially to go and save someone else's the volunteer ethos you're, you're you're volunteering to go on a boat and go out in a really rough sea and save someone 
Uh, so it's quite a powerful thing. Um, I ha- yeah, sorry, just to jump in there. I absolutely, I was actually a leading question because I know you're going to answer that. In okay, that way. fine. Um, <laughs> I, I absolutely that. love that cloud because we work really closely with the R and L as an agency. Oh, fine. Um, and I love some of their like commitments that they've done in terms of like. Um, a lot of the on-site um, purchase UI on-site is like, oh, well, now you can buy like uh, a life jacket for somebody or, or the yeah. purchase have contributed to X, Y, and Z, which I think has been awesome. And I think, did you guys do like cap or hats? Yeah, no, so we, yeah. I was, was going to say, we did, yeah. a, we did a, so we did a collaboration three out of four actually now. Mm-hmm. And it was like, we, you know, when you do collaborations, it's like you have a sort of shared ethos and we bring, uh, you know, knowledge of fabric, sustainability, uh, innovative uh, materials, etc. And um, you know, they br- and then they bring their um, you know their two hundred year history and all the stuff that goes with the online, you know, beautiful ethos, um, which I personally love. And also, so it's great to be able to do a collaboration with them. And then we make a range of products, you know, like knitwear, hats, socks, jackets, that sort of thing um, that has the kind of collab lockup on. And from that, we donated like ten percent to the RNLI, and you know did a good fundraising for mm-hmm. them uh, two or three times now, and really successful. So yeah, so on to question, we do other stuff for charities, um, and that, that's a really good example of one. Love it! I absolutely love that collaboration. Um, now, just kind of going back to growth. So, you know, you've grown the business to employing over one hundred and fifty people now. Yeah. Now, in the agency land, we always people always talk about like difficult business sizes like yeah uh, when you're a team of 20 or when you're doing three million in revenue that's like a really hard milestone to to kind of hit mm-hmm. and get through i.e sometimes it can be difficult to get the margins right at a yeah. certain size has there been like any particular like milestones of size where you've gone fucking out this is a really shit patch or a really difficult growth phase to get through? yeah i mean i think they're all they're all difficult for different reasons well they're all you know they're not they're not difficult they've all got their challenges you know that you've got to deal with and i think um you know the early years there's one of you then there's four of you and then that's that's like you're really close as a you know like as a team and as individuals you're spending a lot of time together both at work and not at work and they're really fun years and We've got some great memories from those times, um, but then you're like, you know, you're, you've you've got the kind of the that you're really tight culturally because you like you know each other's pockets all the time, um, and then it's the question of the product and you're really small, you've got no money, and so that's the sort of set of challenges. Then suddenly there's like ten or fifteen people, and so then that's quite stressful because you've got you've actually got you you've got to hit sales to pay bills at the end of the month. Um, often not paying yourself, you know, so that's, uh, and that's quite a responsibility because suddenly you've gone from, you know, one of you to four or five of you and the sort of, that sort of mentality to there's actually a team here and, you know, people are joining something that's really going now. Uh, and, but they have to, you know, you, you know, they've, they've got their, they've, they, they've, they've got their lives and so you've got to be able to support them. Um, so that, that, that was very stressful. Um, and then I think, you know, when it gets about 40 or 50 people, that was, that was quite hard because I've been sort of split in two in terms of trying to get out and do the brand and looking after people at, um, at back at Wheel Kitty. And um, you got maybe we had a few shots by then. And so then I think that's when the kind of, you can sort of feel the kind of cultural drift sort of starting to creep in. And, you know, because you've got, you could walk in, for instance, in a week and not see someone who, because they're in London and you're in Cornwall or they're here or wherever, and you just you start not seeing people in the business. Mm. So that's when you have to start to really start to embed the kind of culture and what you want, how you want people to turn up at work, what your values are, all that sort of thing. So, um, and that's all. And then actually that's something you, we, you have to work out all the time. Uh, we work out all the time um, now and we'll continue to do so. So it's, um, yeah, that, I suppose those are sort of like, you know, what four or five people, you know, 15, 20 people, and then 40, 50 people. Those, those sort of big milestones uh, with different challenges. Um, but yeah. You know, when you start getting over 100 people within yeah. a business, how, how on earth do you make sure that you're still pumping out that culture and those values, especially, you know, if you guys, you're all over the country, right? You've yeah. You've got yeah. stores, you've got, I'm sure you've got people that are remote, you've got people down in Cornwall. Like how, do you, how do you feel that businesses that do it well as such, and I'm sure you do do it well, like really make sure that when you're onboarding new team members and- uh, Yeah, and, cause it, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, you have to work at it. It's, it's not like, 
it, yeah, it, like all these things, like you never, you never get that. You never like, oh, come on, we'd sort that out. It's like a constant sort of iterative evolution of, mm -hmm. and I guess it's about getting people who have got like an upfront mindset in terms of them be able to, you know, because you're going to get stuff coming at you and you've got to be able to deal with it. So, you know, getting people on board that, you know, can go, oh yeah, that's a, that's a challenge, that's a problem. We got to work at it and figure it out and have have that kind of that kind of view on the world. So, um, yeah, it, it's a constant. It's not like a it's a constant we work out really harder. And you're yeah, right, like you got to eleven stores around the country, getting everyone together, getting people to World Kitty. We're in London quite a lot. Um, you know, getting you know, I think after the pandemic, a lot of people sort of stayed on Zoom and actually meeting up. You know, getting meeting up face to face, face to face, and it's actually not. It, it's quite common sense, you know, like meeting people, you know, just getting together and um, and it, it could easily not be the case. But um, yeah, it's just, I think, I think it's, you just work it at hard um, and you have a set of cultural values that you all agree to and sign up to. And then you, you, you turn up to work and live every day, you know, in theory, yeah. So we've touched on stores. Yeah. 11 stores across the country. Yeah. When did, when did the kind of like, Bricks and mortar journey begin for for Finister. Um, we always had in so Will Kitty, we always had like a rail of products. Mm -hmm. Literally, it was like in the corner of the room, and then used to come in, and then it. So we've always done that. It's always mm -hmm. been mainly D to C, with a small retail element, and then we opened a store in Snagness, and that did, just across the road from the, uh, the shop, from the workshop that it will. And it's Bristol, that's London, and they're just they're all really lovely places where people can go and see the product, you know, talk about. Uh, trips or you know what they're up to um we do events in them film nights product launches that sort of thing so they've they've just something we've always done and they make total sense to us and which one was the, the first one was in St. Agnes. yeah yeah, yeah. And what, what was the kind of like where was your next one uh, bristol bristol and then london yeah nice yeah what have been some of those challenges? Well, I might have been London, Bristol. I can't remember actually. They were quite close together. Yeah. yeah. What What have been the biggest challenges for like bricks and mortar? Because I think we've been through so many like rounds of evolution of like bricks and uh, what is it? In person's dead or brick and mortar's dead, and then it's like oh no, e-commerce is dead, and we're back to brick and mortar. Like, what's your view on all that? I mean, all these things are pretty cyclical. I think you know, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they, they, yeah, there's. Unless there's like huge fundamental changes that, that people need to go to shops mm -hmm. and see products, and you know it's a fun it's a fun thing to do. You know, go and you know it's it's a fun it's a fun experience. Um, so I never ever assumed that it would that it was not going to play a role. Um, although obviously when the pandemic happened, I tried to shut our sh shops overnight, uh, and that was quite worrying because that's like you know forty percent of revenue just just gone. So. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, yeah, we believe that it will always have a role in the business. And is this something you're like continuing to push on, like only more stores? Yeah, we'll do stores. We will, you know, not, we only have, never have like tons and tons of stores, but mm. we will we'll do stores. Yeah, we do stores. And they're really great places to brand. Yeah, I think even when I've been to your Common Garden store, like you really feel the brand, don't you? Like the wood effect that you've kind yeah, of got yeah. going on in there. Yeah. Like you really get that that sense of a brand essence, which I think online... I mean, we're called the e-commerce podcast. So I should, probably shouldn't slag off online too much, but I no, think they play. They're, they're, they're reciprocal. They need each other. You know, yeah. it's not. It's not. It's not binary. It's not one or the other. It's that they are. You need. You know, online needs. You know, retail. And retail needs online, and they they work. It's nice they work together. Um, yeah. Now, we've kind of spoken about like different areas of selling. So yeah. selling online uh, in in retail. Um, what about abroad? Uh, internationalization has that been yeah. part of your growth story yeah we're, we, we're, we're just starting to do put some very good yards down with that now hired a general manager in the states and got some accounts over there and was was that start, and, and germany as well starting to grow that out yeah and what do you how do you kind of imagine it to be like a, a bit of a replica of what we've got going on in the uk or is it like maybe a, a wholesale type yeah probably more wholesale i think with you know, the retail in the US is really is pretty expensive, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you obviously everyone knows you know, loads of brands have lost money doing that. So we're kind of going into it kind of carefully with regards to. So you know, there isn't a plan to roll out loads of stores in the states right now, and it is challenging, right? Because it you know, we see a lot of uh, our own brands kind of going through this journey of. Um, uh, many hurdles to get through whether it's legal challenges getting bank accounts set up 
But then we also see the other side with like Shopify's tech stack where we can instantly turn on a new kind of um, a new territory just to start selling at with a click of a finger. So I think it's interesting that you guys are very much taking that kind of like wholesale approach first of all to really embed in a market because I imagine you've got to get that brand out there. Yeah, but then, yeah, I think, yeah, but then it's like, you know, you, you see the product, you see the brand and then maybe you go online and check it out. So I think having that, that e-commerce availability or, you know, is really important as well. So that's something we're working out as well. So Tom, just to kind of like wrap up the, yeah. this conversation, I, I want to know where you're thinking about for the future because I imagine over the last 20 years, you've heard all the it trends, all the things that are going to be the next big thing that might be and some that are not the trend at all that everyone thought it would be. What kind of like big things are getting you guys at Finisterre really excited about what the future looks like for retailers uh, or people in fashion? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, I think that the, the big thing is sort of working out, you know, what role business plays in and brands play in, you know, the way the world is right now and sort of really leaning into how we, you know, what, you know, the whole B Corp thing is, you know, yeah, business have a role to play in, in you know, if you, if you like, well, well, politicians are not going to do anything. So, um, we have to use the brand as a voice um, for what we believe in and fight for. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I, is really close to my heart and something that I always get really excited about. So, you know, having a real voice and le using, using the brand as a platform to drive change. Um, and that could mean from a content point of view, from a, an event point of view, or from like a product point of view, um, is something that is a sort of like a mindset we have and so it's hard to answer exactly what form that's going to take but that's kind of what we're going and you know we need to you know you know stand up for the ocean and its role in you know the health of the planet and that's the kind of that's what we're, we're here to do and um use the brand to to be a voice piece for that and can you give us any like insider secrets of what finisterre might look like in the future or, or some kind of new things that you might be working on um, yeah, I mean, there's always some product innovation going on. There was, you know, more traceable products. So we've got product coming on, um, which is, you know, you can trace the, um, it's made from, you know, reclaimed ocean waste and you can actually trace where the ocean waste came from. So that's quite cool. So I think improving traceability, uh, and, um, also compliance is a big thing in, you know, talk about greenwashing quite a lot. There's a lot more compliance going on with brands and what they can and can't say. So that'd be important. So brands really getting held to account where they are really doing what they say they're doing. Um, so we're working quite a lot on that right now. And we, yeah, we're doing quite a lot of activist work, a bit of training camps or workshops to help kind of mobilize our community to sort of stand up for, um, what, you know, the ocean and it needs us. Yeah. Nice. Well, look, Tom, I've absolutely loved this conversation. No problem, I love everything that you guys you. are doing. And I, I, honestly, people need to spread the word more and because it is absolutely phenomenal in terms of like the mission and the real impact that you guys are having. So thank you so much no for worries, joining thanks me. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, and we'll hopefully have you back on very soon. Yeah, great. Thanks. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Finisterre are a brand on a mission, meticulously planning every step of their business from supply chain to customer experience. What an absolutely amazing conversation with a founder who has worked tirelessly for the last 20 years. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode six of Child Chats, the e-commerce podcast. Please subscribe on YouTube and we'll see you again very soon. Cheers. Cheers.